listening. So this can be interactive. Anybody feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, Spence, obviously add in uh, what you think. But I thought what we'd do today is go over really how to navigate the MLS and how powerful, um, because this is probably, I would say for me personally, the number one thing in my career that's garnered me business is how to be able to talk more in depth about the market and how to customize that statistical information to really convince people to do things. Um, in my opinion, and I've, you know, trained for decades at two luxury brands and also trained around the country, uh, been in charge of, uh, I spent six years at Berkshire Hathaway being in charge of their Rethink Council, which was the top 30 producers under the age of 35. So went around the country and met with a lot of millennials to see how they do business. And I'm not speaking ill of realtors, but I would say the majority of residential realtors, not so much in commercial, but the majority, I'd say 90 plus percent, they're really good salespeople. They're good at creating connection. Um, and they're good at regurgitating information that they read in the news or that they heard someone else talk about the market, but they're really bad at actually having a backbone and being able to dive in, gather information and statistically say, hey, this is why I think your house is worth X, Y, Z. Hey, this is where the market's gonna go. Hey, let's take a bigger picture look at what's going on here. For example, I got an email yesterday um, from a past client out of the blue and it was an email she sent from her phone and it was a one-liner. And it just said, New Year's goal to sell in 2024. When do you think it's a good time? Um, most agents that I've worked with would just immediately start pressuring that person for a listing agreement. Um and, you know, that may be a reply to the email, that may be a phone call, but they just say, yeah, now's a good time. And sales folk often just jump to that conclusion, like, hey, it's all about me. If I can get another listing and how can I pressure you to sign now? Um, and I sent her back a little bit of data on similar to what we talked in sales meeting yesterday, like the spring market, you're probably going to have more competition, but your house will probably go up a little bit in value between now and June. And so we don't want a lot of competition and we don't want you to miss out on that little spring bump. But before I advise you, I need to know a little bit more. Are you planning to rebuy after you sell? And it sounds very elementary, but she didn't tell me that in her initial email. And that's a big factor in the equation. Why? Well, because if I'm going to advise her on selling and she is going to buy, then I'd say, let's list and sell probably as quickly as possible because you're going to get a better deal on your buy, especially if you're upgrading. Because that buy, let's say your sell's 400 and your buy is 550, that buy is going to get more expensive by spring. And so even though we might take a little less on your sell, you're going to get a better deal on your buy. Um, I didn't dive into all that. I just said, what's your plan? She replied back, um, not buying, like very blunt, very swift response. And to me, that signals probably some financial trouble or something like that. Um, so then I said, well, if you're not buying, then I'd probably advise you to start getting it ready, but we won't list it till March-ish. And in March, you should still have less competition. Um, but be able to get some of that appreciation and we can be kind of strict on how we negotiate with the buyer probably between March, April, May. Um, so th th that's, that's an example. So my, what I have told people for years is um, my expertise would, and what's garnered me pro probably the number one thing that I've done in my career is to show people instead of telling them. So that's today's class. We're going to hop in. 
Um, and I'm going to show you how to show people instead of just hopefully garnering their trust and having them really trust what you say. Okay. So again, this will be recorded and I will send it out to everybody so um, you can rewatch it. Um, and then I'll also have Colin cut this up into uh, quicker little YouTube snippets so people can fast forward and uh, see how to do things pretty easily and fast. Okay. All right. So when you log into the MLS, everyone's familiar with this landing page. This is typically the screen you see. And most of us live right here. We go to search. We click full. Hey, Jake, really fast. Can I jump in? Yeah, hey, man. I, I, I'm so sorry. Can you guys tell me your names again? Uh, I'm Cassie. I'm Douglas. Cassie yeah. and Douglas. Okay. I, I, if I remember correctly, Jake mentioned that you guys have been licensed for eight, eight or nine months. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just okay. That. Okay. So like, you guys are familiar with the MLS, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you guys have been playing with it. You feel a little bit comfortable, all of that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, Jake gives a, a fabulous tutorial on the MLS and I'll jump in with some of my thoughts, but, you know, don't hesitate if like there's certain questions that you have regarding the MLS, because there are a lot of tricks that within the MLS that I think are very, very helpful. And then, you know, which adds to the knowledge base that you could provide to your clients. So again, don't hesitate, make sure you jump in and be like, well, Hey, how do I do this? Because then we can actually show you like while we're like talking. And I, I find that to be very, very helpful. So that was just my like, hope. hey, don't interrupt both of us if you have certain questions. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, cool. we, um, yeah right. we know the basics. We've done CMAs, but we don't know like all the cool tricks and how to make like the stats work for I us. I feel there's and, a lot we don't know. Yeah. 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 Oh, and, and just so you guys know, I mean, there's so, it actually really is a very powerful platform and even me, and I'm on the MLS every single day, there's a lot that I don't, to be super frank, I don't even try to utilize, right? It's just like anything in technology, you know, there's always, it's so powerful, but how much of that are you going to use? But obviously that's a personal preference. Like for example, the way I use the MLS compared to the way Jake uses it is completely different, right? Which that's totally okay. But there are, like I said, there are some tricks that I think that, you know, to help build your knowledge base, because both Jake and I like agree on this statement that, you know, you're providing knowledge and your, your clients want to feel confident that you're a professional. So if you have the knowledge base, et cetera, obviously that goes a long way. So Rock on. Sorry to interrupt, Jake. Go for it. Oh, no problem. Okay. So most of us live here. We go to search residential or the type of property we're looking for. We click full. And let's just say that today we're navigating Pepperwood. Um, you got two ways to do that. You can... Um, go into the subdivision and type Pepperwood. However, that's only going to show properties that the agent actually typed Pepperwood in the name of the project and subdivision. So when I just did that, we've only got five properties. So I typically, if I'm looking at a neighborhood specifically, um, you can count on agents putting zip codes accurately. So if you want to search by zip code, you can or county or city, um, but agents aren't often good or they might misspell uh, a subdivision. So when I'm looking specifically at a subdivision, I will usually do a map-based search like this and I'll zoom in on the area I'm looking at and then highlight it like this. And we'll go from Dimpledale Park over to Lone Hollow work babe just go watch your show and kind of just black out watch your show. play with your ipad the subdivision I'll, I'll get it and then we know we've encapsulated everything um so when we did that we got two more listings so we've got we've got um two agents that didn't 
accurately name the subdivision, okay? Um, now, I think everybody uh, on our team and those that'll watch this later, you're pretty familiar with doing that. What agents don't realize is that if you go back up top and you scroll over to statistics and you click on the statistics tab, you're gonna get seven options, okay? Now, again, having done this so many times um, with many MLS systems, where agents typically get confused is right here. They go to search statistics. They're not sure what type of report they want. They click on one. Let's try the sales per month report. And then the screen looks like the search screen that we just have. Okay. And that right there, I found roadblocks, tons of agents. They're like, wait a minute. All I'm seeing is a search screen. Something's messed up or my MLS isn't working. But what the MLS is saying to you is, instead of searching for a property, you've now clicked on statistics and we're gonna have you search for what you want. So when you're in statistics, you can be as general or as specific as you really want to get, okay? Now, if I'm gonna advise clients, before I give you some examples here, if I'm gonna advise clients in general about the market, kind of rule number one on statistics is the database you're going to pull from and how much information you're getting. So what do I mean specifically by that? If you try to get really narrow, like we just did with Pepperwood, and you say, show me only the statistics in that neighborhood, and we, oh, our map's still drawn. That's another cool thing. If you're already in a search looking for a client, and then you want to give them some statistics, when you scroll over and click the report, it's gonna save whatever you were just searching. So you don't have to redraw a map or anything like that. So we already have Pepperwood drawn and now we clicked view, okay? So what this report is giving us is a monthly snapshot of what's gone on in Pepperwood and it auto defaults to five years, a month by month snapshot for five years. So we can go all the way back to January of 2019 and in that month, you can see three homes sold. That was a volume of just over 3 million in sales. The uh, median list price of those three houses was $799,900. And the median sold price was seven hundred and fifty-eight grand. Meaning in that month, the three sales in Pepperwood got 95% of their asking price. Median footage was 5,500 feet. Median price per foot was 137 median bed six, median baths four, median days on market 23, okay? Back to broad data or narrow data. When I'm giving a neighborhood report and or I'm trying to speak very specifically about a certain area, I will get this narrow. But here's a caution on being this narrow. If you're trying to tell somebody what the market's gonna do or has done, let's scroll all the way down to Last month, two properties sold in Pepperwood, 97% of asking. When the data is narrow or specific, I'm very cautious to tell people things like, oh yeah, in Pepperwood, people are getting 97 to 100% of their asking price. Why am I hesitant to do that? Because the reason November showed that Pepperwood got on average 100% of their asking price is because one home sold for full list price, okay? So that's not really reflective of what's going on in let's say the greater East bench market, okay? So you always gotta get quite specific and first find out what, what the client needs or what you're trying to do with the client. Are you advising a buyer? Or are you advising a seller? And then you can say, well, Right now, in general, let's look at this column, days on market. <clears throat> I'll be at a dinner party and people will say, oh, the market's been really soft, hasn't it? And then Doug and Cassie, you guys said this yesterday in sales meeting. You're like, well, actually, it seems like our neighborhood has been doing pretty good or better than surrounding areas. Well, you could hop into this report and get specific on that. It looks to me, if I look at the past 12 months, that days on market in Pepperwood are pretty fast compared to the general market, okay? So let's check that. 
Here's another cool thing that I teach all the time no one uses. You can open up multiple MLS screens just by clicking this new tab button in the top, and it will open up the exact same tab you just had open, so it copies it. So I can toggle back and forth. I know I got Pepperwood saved here, and now on my new screen, I'm gonna do a new search, and let's eliminate that map, and let's get a little more broad. So this is where tacit knowledge comes in. This is where years of experience, you're able to kind of draw a map and say, well, when I've been showing people that would consider Pepperwood up to 2 million, and they're moving from another state, they're often probably looking from holiday to maybe the flats of Draper. They'd kind of consider that the good schools, East Bench. Again, we don't got to get too specific. We're just trying to get more broad in our data so we can see what the market's done. So let's take from 4,500 South and Holiday and East of 13th East, all the way out to Hidden Valley Country Club. And let's take that kind of prime area real estate and see what's happened, okay? So again, we're not having all the houses pop up because we're in the statistics tab. We click view results. Now we can see that same graphical information, this Excel table, and kind of compare that to what Pepperwood's done. The first thing that stands out to me is now we've got a lot more home sales to go off of. The more data you have, the more confident I am in telling people, yeah, this this is what's the mark. This is what the market's doing. Okay, so we could take this report and now speak pretty eloquently about the luxury east side market. Okay, so let's toggle back and forth really quick. The first thing that stands out to me is in Pepperwood over the last year, the longest month of days on market was last March with 29 days, and that's probably because one of these six houses set on for a while. We look at the broader market, um, that same month was 46 days on market. So we could eloquently say, yeah, homes are selling quicker in Pepperwood, okay? What else could we say? Median sold, the, the, the median S to OL means median sold price compared to original list price. So somebody may start at 1.5, then lower to 1.4, and this is tracking what was their original sales price and then what the property sold for. Um, over the past year, in that broader area, we're seeing you know, months where stuff went for as low as 92% of asking price to 97, 99, 97, 95, 96, 94, 97, 94, 90. So we toggle back over to Pepperwood and there was one low sell in April, but in general, people are getting 99, 104, 101% of their asking price, okay? So now we can say stuff sells faster. And if you list it competitively, um, you know the data shows even in this down market, you should get close to full price. Now, that's if I was advising somebody specific in a neighborhood. Let's talk general market for a second. The example I started with was this gal that emailed me yesterday and said, when should I sell? Okay. I will go get, let's make our report even more broad. And I already told you what I said to her, but let me back that by some data. So now let's just take all of Salt Lake County. And she is in a single family home. So I'm going to remove condos, townhouses, and twin homes. And let's just see what single family residences have done in Salt Lake County. Now, remember, in email, I quickly kind of told her, well, you're going to have less competition if we list sooner, kind of in the end of winter here, but you might miss out on some appreciation. Again, a lot of agents will regurgitate that, but they don't go in and grab the data to prove that to a client. Some clients, if you have a really good relationship, they're just going to trust you. Um, when you get into the higher end, you get a lot of clients that are business savvy, they're engineer minded, and 
They may not ask you for data to back what you're saying, but it's going to go a long way if you reply eloquently in an email with some screenshots of this data to back up what you're saying. Okay. So now we're looking at all single family homes in Salt Lake County on a month to month snapshot of what they've done the last five years. And we've done a large data grab. So whenever I'm asked to speak to the news, um, I'm, I'm typing a newsletter, an article about the market, I try to get as broad as I can because the more data you have, the, the more realistic the picture you're gonna paint of what the market's doing is gonna be. Um, typically as broad as I go is Wasatch Front, Southern Utah in general, and Wasatch back. Those are kind of the, if people say, you know, what's the ski market doing? I'll grab uh, Summit and Wasatch counties and put all that data in. If somebody says what the Wasatch front is doing, I'll go from Ogden to Utah County and include Weber, Davis, Salt Lake, and Utah County. So four counties. Um, Southern Utah I'll typically do, uh, you know, St. George, Hurricane, Tokerville. Um, so, and that's as broad as I get. Usually if I'm getting uh, kind of specific yet general data, I will just do what I just did and search by county. Let's see what Salt Lake's doing. Let's see what single family homes in Salt Lake are doing. Okay. So, you run this search and then you're staring at these numbers and you ask yourself, all right, cool, Derek's logging on. This is gonna be perfect timing for his client. So Derek uh, has a buddy that's written four or five offers at this point over the last two months. Him and I were talking yesterday. He's got a seller that's at, that's at 560 and his client has come up to 545 and both of them have stopped there. Seller says they won't go lower buyer says they won't go higher and Derek's kind of going I've told him everything what do I say to the client at this point what do I say to my buyer to maybe get him to budge a little bit more maybe come up to 560 we've ran comps we've done a CMA it's it's relatively fair um so what do I say now this is a prime example where I'd toggle over to this and I'd say all right Let's go back to our client and speak eloquently about what we think the Salt Lake market might do over the next 30, 60, 90 days if this buyer doesn't take this house for 560 and continues to look. Probably the number one thing you're going to get from your buyers in your career is, mm, well, I've seen everything on the market. I've searched Zillow. Uh, you know, I don't really like anything. I'm going to wait for the right house to come along. I, I know I'm on a tangent here, but indulge me on this. I have an entire hour and a half presentation that I've done for Berkshire Hathaway quite a few times that talks about consumer mentality. We are all jaded, all of us, because we're pre-programmed to shop in a world where we can compare pricing on anything we're gonna buy super swiftly. You wanna buy a TV? Hop online, what's the price on Amazon? What's the price on Costco? Can you get a coupon? Is there going to be a Christmas discount? Are you going to wait for that? Do you want it delivered? Do you want to drive down and pick it up? And we're and and you're you're bickering over a 10% discrepancy in price and how fast you get the product. That has jaded all of us. And every consumer you meet, from low end to high end sophisticated, they're going to bring those shopping habits to real estate. The problem is. Real estate is the only thing we consume that doesn't operate like everything else we buy. There's two main reasons. Number one, it tends to appreciate after purchase. There are a few years in the past 100 where it didn't, but in general, it appreciates. Everything else we buy, the second we buy it, it devalues. But because of that, we're all jaded to think that we have ample time. The second reason is, Real estate is unique. Even a condo complex where there's 100 condos that are all the same, 
there are some differences. One might have newer carpet, one might have a better view. So even if they're all the same in the same complex, every single piece is unique. That's different compared to everything else we buy. Everything else we buy, we can quickly compare the same product and see which vendor is gonna give us the best price. The third reason people typically underestimate is real estate's one of the only things we consume that has an escrow period. So we contract it, but then we continue to negotiate. All right, well then, how do those three things really jack up our consumer mentality when you're getting really tired of showing a buyer who's written a bunch of offers for six months and hasn't contracted anything and they're getting a little frustrated with you, you're getting frustrated with them, yet you can't get them over the fence to make a commitment. Well, it's likely because they're applying all of those consumer jaded habits to their purchase. And to put it bluntly, I'm typically finding agents don't quite have the skill set or the balls to say, look, client, here's the crappy part. If you continue to wait like this, you're probably just going to pay more. Okay. Now, when you're going to drop those bombs on clients, which I do all the time, I'm famous for it. You got, even if they don't ask, you got to back it up with information like this, or they're just going to feel like you're pressuring them to buy. So how would I do that? Back to looking at Salt Lake. What I would say to Derek's client right now is this. Well, if we go back to last December, December of 2022, here's what happened in Salt Lake. 552 total single family homes sold. And, and the median asking price was 599 and the median sold price was 542. So in general, people got 91% of their asking price. And the days on market was 41 days. In January, man, there was even less sales. We were still at 91% and it was 53 days on market. Oh, Mr. Buyer, I did mention to you that as the spring market starts to happen, things really pick up. Your client's like, all right, cool. Well, then that maybe will give me more options to buy. I would say, yes, that's true. But in tandem with more options, last year, we saw sales increase and we popped up to 97% of asking price and days on market started to decrease. Then in March, more sales occurred. We weren't 97, but we we're 96% and days on market went down again. By April, even in a crap year, sales were increased, 97% of asking, days on market got even faster. By May, when most people say, hey, it's the end of the school year. Now's the time for us to buy. Now's the time for us to sell. Sales really increased. We're still sitting at 97%. Days on market 13. June, 98%. Days on market 13. So you're seeing a trend here. Now, a client might give you a little pushback. Yeah, last year was slow. Interest rates, I paid attention to the news. Interest rates went up. All right, cool. Let's see if this trend is typical of Salt Lake pretty much every year. So we reverse up. Let's see what happened in December of 2021. Market was super hot then, and December still had 99% of asking price, nine days on market. But January went to 101%. February went to 104. March was 105. April was 105. Side note here. You might be asking yourself, how the heck did 926 properties sell single family homes in April? of 2022, and on average, people got 105% of asking price. And the average days on market was five. Well, it was bonkers back then. And that means that pretty much every house that was offered on had multiple offers. The price got bid up over the asking price, okay? All right, you can keep going back. December of 2020. 100% asking price, January 101, February 102, March 105, April 105, May 106. I now feel confident that I could tell Derek's client, hey, look, whether a market is up or down like it was last year, we still see a spring bump. You want me to get specific for you? In hot years, that seems to be 
five, six, seven percent increase in asking price. And in a soft year like last year, it's still five or six percent. Now I can confidently say, hey, look, that 560 house in January compared to March or April is going to be 590 to 600. Whether it's an up or down year. And the client may then say, all right, but you know, this is in this specific neighborhood and is this neighborhood doing that or is this zip code and get very granular. At which point I would say, look, dude, this, this is just a, a trend in Salt Lake. Okay. So there are literally hundreds of ways that you can paint a statistical picture. And all we just walked through in the last, you know, five minutes or so was using one data point, list to sell price ratio, and maybe a little talk about days on market. We could say something like, and it gets worse for you. Because not only is it likely we see multiple offers in the spring, not only is it likely that we see this type of appreciation, I've shown you that ha that happens in down years or up years, but it even gets worse for buyers because days on market goes down. So you really don't have these consumer uh, jaded shopping habits that you're applying to your real estate. It makes you even more stressed and more pressured as we heat up in spring. At this point, instead of telling a client this sales pitch, which a lot of realtors will regurgitate, that they don't know how to back up with data, we've now shown the client, hey, this is what happens. And uh, gosh, I would say in my career, I, I've i gotten to the point where I can be extremely convincing. And I'm pretty good at getting most people to have this information sink in and then say, all right, Jake, I'll go to 560 and contract this house. But inevitably, uh, nobody's perfect and, and you run into hard head people and they kind of take all that into consideration and they still don't make a move. Here's my advice on that. Um, it's always worth your time to walk people who are struggling through this type of info because you then become their realtor for life instead of their salesperson. And whether they make a decision right now or not, they're going to go, all right, my agent really knows the market and really knows how to advise me. Um, I call it bomb dropping and then backing off. I will get very specifically firm with clients, give them this type of information, and then wrap it up with something like, you know, now you know, um, but ultimately the decision's yours. I'm here for you. If this isn't the right place, you know, I, I'm with you for this ride or we'll keep looking or, or, or something like that. Leave the door open. All right. All we did <laughs> so far is use one type of the seven statistical reports you can use and hone in on one number. The art here, and this takes years, and I'll tell you the number one way to do it and I've said this so many times and people just don't do it. The number one way to get good at this stuff is spending time searching in the MLS, which every agent is already doing if they have a client, and then making yourself take that same search, toggle over to the statistics tab, and click around and play with it yourself. That's the only way to you know, get pretty good at it. If you get good at navigating the MLS, that's like class 101, um, you're already more powerful than most agents out there. The art form is then doing what I call painting the picture. The art form is this. You got to step back for a second and ask yourself, what is the client asking me? What, what's their roadblock? What's their problem? What are they trying to do? Um, are they a buyer? Are they a seller? Are they an investor? Am I trying to convince fund someone from another state they should buy their first rental property here? You got to start with that. Then you got to go start clicking around and say to yourself, how do I paint a picture to advise them on what they're doing? And that picture 
can often be what they don't want to hear. It's very often some negative information or it's counterintuitive to what they're thinking. And I have found that the number one roadblock for agents is at that point, they don't quite dare to tell their client. And they go back to just saying, oh, let's keep looking or don't worry, hold firm on your price. We haven't had a good buyer come along yet, but it's been the holidays. So you're listing, you know, let's give it another month. And when those types of things go stale, your relationship goes stale with the client. They don't think you're doing anything. Um, so let's shift gears now and let's uh, suppose we're advising a seller. So let's say we've got a listing that we've already put on the market and it's not selling and the seller's asking what we're doing marketing wise and they're getting kind of frustrated and we want them to lower price because we know it's not going to sell for what they're asking. And we, we're struggling with what we want to tell them. Okay. So back up to the top toggle. Whenever you want to see your personal listing inventory, you go here. Now this might kind of sound silly because if you have one listing, you're going to go, Jake. I uploaded it. I've seen it online. Like I know what, what I have for sale. Well, what you may not know is that if you go here and look at your own listing inventory, let's take Spencer's listing here on Washington Street. This is that modern townhouse I mentioned yesterday. When, when you go search like you do for a client and you pull up your own listing, you are going to see what agency. And I've found that most agents, when they're trying to look at their property they have up for sale online, they go here, they go active, they go to this property we're going to look at, 869 Washington. Where's our street? And, well, oh, it's not. Awesome. It was right below where you put it. All right. And they look at it like this. Oh, there's my listing. Spencer Janke. Oh, it looks good. Verbiage is right. Square footage is right. Pictures look good. There's my listing. Okay. <laughs> so many agents don't realize that if you go over to my listings, click on my inventory and look at it this way, you now get a statistical report on what type of online search traffic has come to your own listing. And you can only do this with your own listing. You can't see everyone else's. So let's call it the back end. Here's the back end of Spencer's listing on Washington where we can share it immediately on Facebook, Twitter, email it to a client. This auto formats it so it looks really cool. So this is a, a good way to send your listings to people. Side note, we do in our CRM that we use have an updated list of all uh, Utah uh, Salt Lake Board of Realtor licensees. So if you're ever wanting to do an email blast about a price change or something like that, we have a current list. We pay to keep it current. Colin has that uploaded in our CRM. All you need to do is probably email me and or Colin um, or text us and say, hey, I want to send this out. And we can format it, make it look pretty and send it out to all licensees for you. Um, that used to be a service we had to pay like 50 to 75 bucks per email blast. Um, I finally found a way to kife the, the list. And uh, so we do that for free. Okay, so you can edit your listing. You can share it all there. That's cool. Hopefully most of you know that. What agents don't know and never use, I, literally our team is the only team I've ever seen that consistently uses this when we have a frustrated seller saying, what's going on with my listing? You go over here to the views column and you can click this number that's a hyperlink. When we click this number, it gives us this report. What is this saying? This is saying since the inception of Spencer's listing, which has now been on the market 79 days, it's had 28,040 views online. 3,424 of those were agents. 24,000 and change were public views, meaning a consumer found it on Zillow, Trulia, or many of the other search websites. Um, 25,000 people 
found it by a map-based search. Three people have saved it as a favorite. Three people have ignored it. What do those two mean? And ignore is when a realtor sends your listing to a client in the MLS as a suggestion, maybe of a property they should look at or whatever, and they click ignore. They, they don't want to view it. Um, a favorite is when a consumer goes to utahrealestate.com or a realtor sends your listing to somebody and they've created a profile on Utah Real Estate and they actually saved your property. So Spencer's got three people that are kind of watching this listing. Now, when you've got a frustrated seller, they may say, have you shown it? How many showings last week? How many calls? Uh, I just had this this morning on, on that industrial land I have up in Ogden. The guy follows up with me at least weekly. And I don't have much to tell him. It's not a house that someone can view. Nobody's called on it in a couple months. It's, it's a unique piece of real estate. But I typically will go back to this report and say, hey, uh, I know you're not stoked about this. But since we lowered price two weeks ago by 25 grand, two more people have favorited it. And a favorite is a pretty darn good indicator of saying, well, there are some people watching it. And if somebody's watching it online, but hasn't come physically to view the property yet, they're probably just crossing their fingers going, let's see if this guy lowers from 725 to 699 or something like that. Okay. Um, let's glance at a few of our other listings. Like Matt on sales meeting yesterday mentioned that his luxury property up in Midway um, asking 2.095 uh, million had nothing, no showings, anything over 60 days. Then finally over Christmas, he contracted it um, for 100,000 off list, okay? That property's had a decent amount of traffic. Now, when you get more listing inventory, you can start even, or I'm sorry, even um, more eloquently advising your client um, because you're able to say things like on my turquoise listing that closes next week, this was a flipper and it was a pretty hot property. And you can see he was only on market 53 days until we contracted and he had almost 50,000 views and 10 favorites. Why am I bringing that up? If at some point in the future here, one of you only has one listing and you're sending this report to your client or you're using it to kind of advise them, don't hesitate to reach out to me or Spence and have us look brokerage or company wide and then compare your client's traffic to say the hottest listing we have. Once you see quite a few of these, you get pretty comfortable telling a client, hey, look, You've only had, you know, you've had under 10,000 views in the first seven days on market. Nobody has favorited it and a bunch of people have ignored it. That signals to me instantly before I even run a CMA that they're overpriced, okay? Doesn't mean the property's crap or anything like that. Every kind of property sells. It's just a factor of price. Um, and then you can say to them, hey, we've got another listing. Um, that my partner's selling or however you want to say it. And it went under contract pretty fast. And in the first week it had 30,000 views and 15 people favored it. Once you've seen these enough, you're able to start telling a client, hey, look, you know, we got a lower price and here's why. And that is more powerful than just saying, hey, I ran a new CMA. Uh, maybe we we're a little overpriced. Let's think about a price adjustment. What does a client say back to you as soon as you say that? They say, well, 30 days ago, you told me to list here. And you're going, eh, I wanted to go 550, but you said 600. So we agreed to go 599, 900 and lower it. Every client I've ever had forgets that that's what we talked about when we signed the listing agreement. I'm kind of famous for making people write a sticky note and put it on their fridge if they agree at signing that we'll lower. Um, but regardless, they're going to say, well, but we have had some showings at 600 and I want to hold firm or things have changed or whatever it is. You can 
show them instead of telling them by diving into these reports and going, all right, although we haven't had any showings, here's what's gone on digitally. Uh, Last thing I'll say about this report is if you, you probably won't get a client that asks this, but sometimes people get really technical and they're like, what does this really mean? Like, how did, how are you getting this information? What's happening is when you list a property and put it into the MLS, utahrealestate.com, that is the source of the listing information. How that house is showing up on all these other websites, Zillow is probably the most popular, but realtor.com, all of them. The technical term for it is it's called an IDX feed. Okay. All of those major national websites are paying the MLS systems for an IDX feed to populate their website, okay? And MLSs have gotten smart. There's now over 600 of them in the country. They have varying quality of IDX feeds that they sell. And most of the national major websites pay for the cheapest IDX feed because they're buying 600 of them. That That's, I guarantee that's Zillow's biggest expense, okay? Why does that matter? That IDX feed and them buying the lowest quality feed is why you get clients all the time shopping on these websites and then sending you 10 properties they want to see. And then you go into the MLS system and four of them are already under contract. So you can't see them. And two of them, you can't even find in the MLS. And you're going over to Zillow going, how the heck did my client find this? And that's because Zillow displays, <laughs> this is getting too deep. Zillow is one of the few websites that as soon as somebody's 30 days or greater late on their mortgage payment, it becomes public knowledge in judicial foreclosure states. As soon as that becomes public knowledge, you can get those lists for free. I've got a local title company that'll send you that email every week if you want to see everybody that's defaulted in Salt Lake. Zillow displays those with a blue bubble as for sale properties on their website. They are not for sale. Somebody just missed a payment. And over the last few years, the likelihood of that missed payment actually becoming a foreclosure over the next six months is like less than 1%. But our clients go on Zillow and it looks like that's a for sale property in the neighborhood they're looking for, okay? All that stems back to the IDX feed. What I will typically tell clients is, just shop on utahrealestate.com. It's updated in real time. That's the main source. And when you get good at describing how this IDX feed works, you can really discourage people um, from shopping in other locations and uh, getting super confused. Okay. All right. Let's see. We're going to wrap up here in just a second. I just want to give you a very fast download on what the power of some of these other reports, but we definitely won't dive as deep as we did on the last few. Okay. Can I jump in really fast? Cause yeah, I yeah, got to go ahead. here in a minute. Yep. So you guys, like one thing that like I, you might be doing this already, but one thing that both Jake and I started doing 20 years ago when we first got into the business is every day. And I still do this today. Every day I jump on the MLS and I just do active number of days back. Are you, can you hear me, everybody? We lost, yeah, we lost you when you said numbers of days back. Okay, so yeah. So I always just log in, do active number of days back. I put one. So that way I can look at everything that has been listed in the last 24 hours. If you do it every day, like ironically, like, yeah, in the spring, you might have, you know, 50 to 75 properties that get listed in a day. But like right now, there's usually only like 20. And the reason why I do that is if I do it every single day, I'm seeing everything live, like the moment it hits. So you, you quickly start seeing patterns in regards to pricing, right? So if the market has shifted or whatnot, if you're watching that every single day, 
you'll start to notice be like, oh, wow, you know, properties over, you know, a million dollars. We're starting to see those soften a little bit. And now, you know, we've seen a lot of price reductions, et cetera. And I find that to be a very, very quick way to kind of like learn the market. So you do that every day for like a month and you're going to quickly have a very, very good understanding of pricing in each area. So you'll be like, oh yeah, well, Sugar House, like I've been watching it for a month and, you know, there's been a lot of properties listed, but I've been seeing like what they're being listed for. So that way you build that knowledge base of pricing and locations and everything like that. So again, that was just, that's something I do. And I have found that to be extremely helpful. So again, just my two bits. Thanks, dude. Go ahead. Um, I'll show you really fast what he means. So he's just going into full search every day as if he's searching for a client saying, let's show me everything that's active in Salt Lake County and number of days back one. So you put in those three things. There's been 51 properties. Click view results. You're seeing everything that came on the market in Salt Lake in the last, uh, yesterday. Okay. All right. Uh, five minute uh, fire hose on some of these other reports and how to use them. Okay. The very top one is just an in general market data. You cannot manipulate this report, but it's a really good one when people say, uh, how's the market? Uh, you know, what do you think Salt Lake's going to do? I will uh, often pull this up and click download. You can download to a PDF or a CSV right here and send this to any client that just says, hey, I'm maybe looking at moving to Salt Lake or I get a referral. Um, the other thing I will do a lot, a lot, a lot is either download or right click on my screen and screenshot reports like this save it. And now when I go to do an email, I just insert that in the body of the email when I'm answering their question. If you get good and fast at it, it literally only takes seconds. And you can write really eloquent emails as opposed to just typing out type and somebody's got to read it and they're probably not really going to interpret what you do. The other thing I will do is do what we're doing right now, but in like, I try to keep it three minutes or less. Somebody has a question. I know I can eloquently answer it in the MLS. I schedule myself a Zoom meeting really fast on my Google Calendar. I click on the meeting. I click record. I then open the MLS like we have it right now. I share my screen and I narrate, just like I'm doing to you guys. I narrate about the report. I end the meeting. The download, uh, the, the video immediately comes to me uh, through Zoom. It's formatted good. I used to take the time to upload them to YouTube, but I don't really even have to do that anymore. And then I cut and paste the video link and answer the, the client's email by saying something like, hey, man, got your question. Watch this three-minute video when you have a second. Very powerful. Right? That wins people over. So the first one is this. It kind of speaks in general and gives you graphs on um, the number, the amount of listings entered into the entire MLS system from 2020 to 2024. So this this empowers you to answer questions like, was well, inventory down, is inventory up? What do you expect it to do? You come here and you go, all right, in January, over the last five years, here's how many listings went into the MLS system. Uh, 4,100 and change in 2020, 3,300 in 2021, 3,300 in 2022, 3,200 in 2023 and 213 so far in the first two days of this year. Now, then you can speak eloquently about the trend of, oh, more listings, but more competition are going to come on in February, March, April, May, and June. Look, up market, down market, doesn't matter. That's happened every single year statewide in the MLS system over the last five years. You can bank on it, okay? So I would use that to advise a seller that asked me yesterday, when should I list? Well, it's a catch-22. We're going to have more competition for sure, starting in March, for sure. We can bank on that. Um, but what does pricing do? We can scroll down and kind of see uh, what pricing is done. This takes that same graph and puts it into uh, the exact numbers in each county 
So here's Salt Lake County and here's how many listings came on each month. Um, and then if you scroll down, it gives you that same graphical information for the amount of properties that went under contract in any given month and uh, the amount of properties that sold, okay? So you can't manipulate this one and it is MLS wide, which can include down into St. George. I mean, you've seen that everything that's on the MLS. It's not necessarily everything because St. George has their own system that hardly anyone uses. Park City does have their own system, which they're kind of hoity-toity up there. And uh, some agents in Park City still only list on PC MLS. Obviously, we're not grabbing that data, but we also have, our brokerage has full-blown PC MLS access through Jamie. We pay for that so we can grab the same info for their market. Luckily, most Wasatch back agents now will list a property on PCMLS and utahrealestate.com. That's kind of become the norm. Okay. The next report, we're going to go a tiny bit over here. Okay. Let's clear this. The next report is called an absorption report. Uh, I don't use this a ton, but let's look at what it is for Salt Lake County. And this is simply going to tell you, all right, how many months of inventory do we have? Okay. And this confuses people a lot, but if you go across the months up top, it says in Salt Lake County, if you take what's happened over the last two months, we've had 1,795 properties come on market. 195 are currently in backup position. They have an offer, but they're still advertising. 806 are under contract. 1,507 have sold. That's an average absorption of 753 properties a month, which says we have 3.71 months of supply. If you go back 12 months, which gives you a more broad check on what the market's done and removes the seasonality of the market, we have 2.94 months of supply. This is simply a report that you could check once a month and go, oh, wow. In a hot market, there were times that we had 0. 0.0 something percent of in there or uh, months of inventory, like two weeks of inventory. Okay. So a healthy market, according to economists, is three to six months supply, which means it's not necessarily a buyer's market, not necessarily a seller's market. We haven't had that in about a decade, and that's where we're at right now. Um, but it's people think it's bad, and it's barely on the edge of an equilibrium market. And as soon as it pops below three months, which if we take the last 12, it kind of is, it's a seller's market again. As crazy as that sounds, even if we're being down, sellers still have the power because inventory is low. Home sales graph only updates quarterly, but I will use this one as opposed to the table we spent a lot of time on earlier today. And the reason is it's simpler and it looks prettier and it gives us almost the same info but it just puts it in a graph, okay? This is the number one statistic I use um, when I'm trying to just screenshot and send somebody a graph. Again, the problem is it only updates quarterly. So it just updated two days ago on December 31st. So now is a good time to look at it. And what is this telling us? This gives us a quarterly snapshot of the last five, uh, four years and gives us three data points. What has median price done? How many listings came on? How many listings sold? So we go all the way back to January of 2019. The median price for everything in Salt Lake was 325. 3,200 and change properties sold. 4,800 and change came on the market. When you get good at looking this at this, here's what I tell clients. When there's a big gap between green and black, what does that mean? It means... Quite a few properties came on the market, but far less sold. And when you look at this a lot, you'll see that there's trends regardless of, of up or down market. And that trend for me is if the green and the black lines touch or intersect, which usually happens every second quarter because of that spring bump, that means we're all of a sudden selling more properties in that quarter than even came on the market. Like clockwork, you can reverse this back if you want. Let's go all the way back to the freaking Great Recession. Like clockwork, when green and black cross, 
that is a precursor to telling you the market's pricing is going to go up. It's it's simple economics. We're selling more than we have supply. And when you see that happen, which is typical of the second quarter, if we really zoomed in here, we could see that happens almost every second quarter all the way back to 2006, pricing goes up, okay? Um, if you're just trying to speak eloquently about pricing, let's take 2020 to current, make this graph a little easier to view. And somebody says to you at a dinner party, oh, well, I heard the market really crashed or it's going to or whatever. Here's a clean, pretty way to say, well, hmm, in Salt Lake County, really, I think I said this yesterday in sales meeting. Now I'm going to prove it to you guys. May of 2022 was our peak. Why do I say it's the peak? Well, that's the absolute highest that the blue line has ever gotten. It's the highest median price we ever achieved. If I was advising a client in May of 2022, though, I would say sell freaking now as fast as possible and be competitive. Why would I say that when we just hit top all-time pricing? Because a client's going to say, well, probably going to keep going up. It's only May. I would say, yeah, there's a problem with that. It's the second quarter. And look at this gap between the green and the black line. Once you're used to looking at these, you go, A, that's a huge gap. B, it's the second quarter. If we reverse back 20 years, typically in the second quarter, those lines pretty much intersect or touch. So this was an anomaly second quarter. Way more properties than we're selling came on the market. That shouldn't happen in spring and pricing's peaked out. So I'd tell a client, list, sell now, be super competitive. That client's going to love you by the fall because we declined from about 530 to 500. Eh, that doesn't seem like that big a deal, but that's 6% in six months. So if we're in the million range and we advise the client, we probably just saved them a hundred grand. And it's very likely that at that time of year, they were thinking the property would continue to rise in value over the summer, okay? This is where you get super powerful. This is where you win clients for life when you're able to pull up this info and give them a little bit of a prediction on what, what might happen, okay? Um, and this last thing I'll say, this is a report that I very often just screenshot this graph and or do the Zoom meeting, narrate, and then show them what I think is gonna happen, okay? All right. Quarterly comparison, you probably never use it. Why? It um, As soon as it generates, it only has an export tool. And it says, hey, do you wanna export this to Excel? When you really dive deep in data, this allows you to take the data out of the MLS and put it into an Excel spreadsheet, and then you can use Excel to manipulate the data. If The only thing I'll say about that type of reporting is if any of you have an opportunity for a bigger real estate transaction, you're talking to a developer about buying a land and possibly building a subdivision, um, you know things like that. You don't need to worry about learning all this. Just let me know. I'll come to the table with you and we can really powerfully, I could generate a report that shows all new construction, Salt Lake County, export it to Excel like that and give them very specific information on what new construction is doing. Um, and that's really it. The, the very last one is just what's called daily snapshot. Kind of like Spencer said every day, he hops in and checks new. This is another kind of way of doing that without viewing the properties themselves. Every day you go over to statistics, click on daily, and this says, hey, today is January 3rd, and we're going to compare January 3rd this year to January 3rd last year. I'm going to change this to Salt Lake County because this is MLS wide. So in Salt Lake County, on this day last year, 1,875 properties were for sale. Today, 1,795, there's 4% less inventory and so on. Um, we're, we're way down in under contracts, way down in sales compared to this time last year. Um, you can also expand this report to a date range. One day is kind of hard to compare because let's say last year, the same day was a Sunday and people didn't input data. So you can get a little more general and say, uh, just show me all of December. 
and compare last December to this December in Salt Lake County. And the report will generate for you. And then you can speak eloquently to a client to a client about, you know, the time this year compared to same month last year. And it'll build you all these graphs. Okay. So thanks for hopping on. I hope that is helpful and useful. We'll send out um, a full link of the class so you can just kind of get familiar with fast forwarding and watching my screen clicks. Uh, but I'll tell you the number one thing you can do, just hop in and do this for yourself. As soon as you play with it five to 10 times. And for me, what makes it stick is not just this checklist requirement, like, oh, I need to do this for 10 minutes a day. If you have curiosity about what your parents' house is worth, about what a certain neighborhood or zip code is doing, about what the county is doing in general. If you have a curiosity, use that to excite you to then hop into the statistics tab and, and garner that information. And everything we did today, you can get as crazy specific as you want. You can go, all right, cool. I want to see all that same information in Salt Lake County for multifamily properties, duplex, triplex, fourplex. How are those going? Put that in your search, click enter, and all these reports will generate that way for you and show you data on whatever you enter. Okay. Awesome. All right. Any other questions, you guys? I mean, um, you know, Jake kind of mentioned when we first hopped on that maybe, you know, we could like go to a couple of your appointments or kind of just like shadow you a little bit, Spence. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I just responded to your go. text. Yeah. And like, I definitely find that to be very, very helpful, obviously, for a lot of reasons. So yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, just like Jake, I'm kind of all over the place, but I'm definitely obsessed with like my phone and I try to answer my phone 100% of the time. But like, like, for example, I've got a new listing um, in Old Mill, going to list it for $1,350,000. Um, I'm actually going to go over to that property to talk to the sellers because I'm planning on putting it up for sale in about two weeks. So I'll be there. I'm going on Friday at 10 o'clock. I'm happy to have you, like, you guys come, one of you come, whatever, if you if you want. You don't need to answer that question right now, but you can just shoot me a text if, if you're available. And then, yeah, I've got a few buyers that I'm going to be showing as well that, you know, again, everybody has their own style, which is totally like acceptable, but you can at least kind of see, you know, how I do it. And it's funny because Jake and I have been partners for 20 years, but we're partners because we're completely different. So the way he does things versus the way I do things, I mean, it's black and white, right? You just kind of have to find your niche. But, but yes, to answer your question, absolutely. Love to have you come along. And um, I've got two really cool listings coming up, one in Old Mill, and then I'm listing a six and a half million dollar home in Tavachi, right at the mouth of Big Cotton Canyon. <clears throat> so yeah, like again, I'm gonna go to that, to the Old Mill listing at 10 o'clock on Friday, if you guys are available. Yeah, tag along, it'd be, be awesome. We'd love that, thanks, we'll totally do yeah. that. Yeah, and then I know I said this in the text message, but look, like, you know, one thing that I think is extremely important in real estate, one of the reasons why Jake and I have been partners for 20 years is, I mean, you could ask Jake because he'll back me up on this one. I mean, I call Jake just to bounce ideas off, even though, like, I know the legality, I know everything, I'm a broker too. And, but at the same time, sometimes it's helpful to bounce something off of another person. So I, I bring that up because, look, Jake and I have been doing this for 20 years. We've sold over a billion dollars of real estate. There's really nothing that we haven't seen or done. So oftentimes it's like, look, I can probably answer that question in five seconds. So, you know, don't, you know, be like thinking and be like, oh my gosh, how do I figure this out? Just call me. And again, like I will, if I don't answer, it means I'm with a client, but I will always call you back and, you know, I can talk you through that, you know, same thing when it comes to marketing and 
how you want to present yourselves. We've got some really, really fun uh, marketing things that we're going to be starting here in the next two weeks. We're, we're going to go heavily on like professional videos and I'm going to be doing at least eight a month. And so same thing. I think it would be very, very smart for you guys to also do several of those. So that way we can kind of introduce you to the public. Yeah. Now, uh, everybody has their sensitivity on how they want to market, et cetera, which is totally okay. But I only bring that up because, again, I think it would be very, very good for you guys to actually start doing things like that. And again, we will dive into the details as we go. But my big point is just don't hesitate. Just text us, call us, whatever. And I'm happy to, you know, have you guys come along, et cetera. Um, out of the team, I'm probably the one guy that works too much. So, I mean, I work every weekend, usually if I'm in town. So Saturdays are always my busy day. So, I mean, I have three appointments this Saturday. I'm trying to avoid Sunday this week, but I might end up working on Sunday as well. So, you know, again, just call me and I'd be happy to chat through it, help you guys out. All of the above. Great. Thanks. We're super yeah, excited. Yeah, why don't you guys plan on uh, on Friday at 10 and Spence will get you details on where to meet. Okay. Yep. I will, I'll text you both. 